Well, good afternoon, and thanks for joining us for our weekly Wednesday creativity workshop um, with Adobe Education. Um, today is Wednesday, October 30th, um, and today I'm very excited to be joined by Maureen Velasky, who's joining us all the way um, from Germany and is an Adobe Education leader. Um, and today, Maureen is going to be talking about the design basics um, for teacher presentations. So looking forward to learning something new today. Thank you for joining us. Well, thank you, Clara, for introducing me, and welcome to everybody, um, the people that know me, like Lucas, and the people that don't, like Georgina. And so what I'm going to present today is something that we've presented uh, a couple times already in uh, workshops for educators that strive to have better presentations and just have more um, attractive visuals to, to bring their, whatever their various curriculums are, to bring those across better to their students. So in the hopes that this will help everybody, um, I'll start sharing my screen now. And this, that'll go just like this, right? All right. So, everybody okay? Can everybody see it? Good. So the 10 rules, um, are a sort of work in progress. So you're welcome to sort of give input if they work for you and if they should be modified. <laughs> because uh, Catherine, my, my co-partner in this, in this presentation, was, was okay with six, but I worked it into 10 because I think they are all important. So we'll just go through it. Good design does matter. Um, I think we all are pretty much on board with that. Um, we see it in our daily, you know, consumption preferences and whatnot. So, to I'm going to roll it back before I get to the the ten rules and what governs the rules in general. The three things that govern human perception, and I'm taking this from Michael Pollan's um, great book, his latest book. Um, human perception is influenced by three major forces. The first one being I guess we don't talk about it enough, but it's pretty obvious because we're all a product of it, is sexuality. So just keep that in the back of your head when you're thinking about um, design. And the second major force is nourishment. And with nourishment, what's meant by that is the physical, obviously, food, but also psychological. So we're, we're teachers because we love giving psychological nourishment. So that's a force to be reckoned with. The third force that we're, the human perception is, is guided by is beauty, and we underestimate the power of beauty. But we kind of don't, and I'm gonna show you why. Um, good design is also educated, meaning you're thinking about these things. What, what is perception doing? What is education doing? What is cultural influence doing? Um, and, but the recognition of good design is not necessarily an automatic, simultaneous skill set which is what, why I find these rules important to teach and to, um, well, to share with you now. Um, when, we, when we see excellence, we know it, and we see it in a lot of our you know, lives as consumers. We, we know when we walk down um, you know, these, I don't know, what is it in, in Los Angeles' is Rodeo Drive, in Munich it's the Maximilianstrasse, there's different streets where all, all the major high-end luxury products, they all use beauty to communicate. We know it when we see it. We also see it in other things, like cultural things will, will extend a lot of effort to use beauty to communicate um, a lot of things. And this, and this one thing I really think is an excellent designer that works with paper. So these are paper masks that describe emotions. And this, in this particular image, it's um, discussed. In this image to the left, it's contempt, and the right is sadness. And so we see these masks, and we're just automatically in awe of them, at least I was. And I followed this man's work because he's just a genius in, in paper cutting and paper design. So the word awesome, let's look at that also, because the word has been used very liberally um, lately. And it's interesting when the word is translated in various languages. I don't know how you all feel about that, but in English, at least, there's another product or product line of products that I, I myself happen to find 
beautiful, if not awesome sometimes, not always, but sometimes. Um, so the word awe is, it's an emotion variously combining dread, interestingly, and in German, the, the translation is also in this line, it's very interesting. What's, what's more, uh, um, I think what we're using in this sense is now a sense of wonder that is inspired by this sublime, well, by beauty, something sublime, something without, um, you can't find words to describe it. So there's some, you're standing in awe of something that you just can't explain, nature's wonders. So the power to create awe is incredible because you are ha you have the you know the power of the sacred so to speak. So that's another reason why design is important. We have to recognize what we're doing with it. We're really creating something very powerful. So good enough design. Oh, there's an end missing. Excuse me for that. Um, good enough design. I'm going to put that in air quotes. Um, fulfills a purpose. Uh, Functionality is, you know, it's, it's it's a given that a presentation will work if, you know, if it's, you know, somehow put together, but not exactly. So it's a paper plate, right? It's not it's not all that because you're not a designer. But that can also be an anesthetic, meaning it kind of puts, you know, there's just no pop to it. So you might be losing your audience. That just might be happening. You might get the information across, but you might not be fulfilling the potential that you could necessarily you know, have. The opposite side, of course, is good design is something sensual. It fulfills the purpose with a complete activation of the senses. When I, I'm using you know, food to describe this purposefully, because I think we get an idea of the difference between the anesthetic and the aesthetic um, realms, I guess you could say, that we're, we're trying to activate by being a good designer. So now we're going to dive into the 10 basics. And um, again, it's a work in progress because these basics have, you know, we're, we're in a very fluid world and a lot of things are changing. And so particularly number nine, <laughs> but we'll get to that. So first and foremost, the contents. Um, the contents you need to think about first and foremost. My, one of my design mentors, um, one of his you know, premises that his whole office had to, was governed by was first think, then design. So you have to think about what you're, you know, what the content is that you're trying to communicate. That's the first and foremost thing before you even lift up a pencil. The second thing before you lift up that pencil is to think about the audience. And this isn't always as easy as it sounds. Um, it might have a primary and secondary audience, but generally we do know who we're, who we're geared, gearing toward. Think about that audience and find the medium and the, the, the visuals and everything is sort of geared to that particular audience and meaning the way they perceive, the way they think, the, the, the way they use their mediums, media, um, such as social media. But the, if the answer does happen to be, I don't know, could be anybody, um, we have an answer to that with rule number eight. So. Um, I'm going to use the green for the rules and then I'll, I'll switch colors. You'll see in a second what I mean. So the third rule is the layout, the structure, the grid system of every media, medium that you use is sort of a must do. You can break that rule once you know what you're doing with that rule, but you do have to divide space. You have to structure your format, assuming you've already defined the format. So a grid system is to use space in a structured and defined way because um, I'm going to give an example of um, uh, a building. So architects, you know, they, they define space by giving it floors and doors and windows and whatnot. And obviously, if you've ever been in the Tower of Pisa, you know that that crooked building doesn't exactly, um, it's not exactly trustworthy. I mean, you might go in because everybody else is doing it, but you want to live in a house that's straight. <laughs> so when space is, is structured in a certain way, it's trustworthy. That's just the same with a structured space on paper or on a digital medium as it is in a structured space in architecture. That's my thesis anyway. Um, and creating grid systems is not a new thing. I mean, it's been around for a long time. Villard de Honnecourt, I'm not exactly sure the, the year, but I think it was the 16th century or so. 
I'm sure Lucas will correct me on that one, but the grid systems, you know, defining spaces with um, particular mathematics has always been the way that the, the, the greats have done it. And we've sort of lost that with with the the ease of, of creating, um, you know, creating media and all, of all sorts, but to think about space first will help your design, I guarantee that. And you might, I'm sure you might be familiar with InDesign, and if not, you might want to refresh the idea of the, the how grid systems work, work in InDesign. And just to give you a refresh, refresher from my side, a horizontal and vertical grid, um, which orders all the text, images, and other elements, um, you can you can sort of beam it in and out and in and out, which is uh, I'm not going to do it right now because it'll, it'll so, you know I could go into design go into InDesign and show you how the ins and outs of these horizontal and vertical grids using them and making them disappear. I'm sure you could, you, you can hit the W in InDesign to make them disappear, but I encourage you to work with them and design with them a lot and then and then. Um, you know, pop them in and out essentially, because that will help you to see if your space is being, you know, um, the, the space, uh, I'm, I'm trying to find the word in English, the definition of space is working in your grid. I'll get to how, what I mean with that in a little bit. So uh, I apologize for the fact that my InDesign is in German. <laughs> A lot of my students have InDesign in all sorts of different languages, so, so I'm not exactly sure how I've translated this <laughs> with Render und Spalten is, I think, margin, margins and columns. But this is like one of the most important boxes in InDesign to define those, uh, the vertical grid and also the column grid, which is, um, you see it underneath. So don't underestimate this little box is all I'm saying for your vertical grid. It'll give you something like this, and um, mind you, it's sort of like traffic rules. They're lanes that you can be in one very um, methodically, but you can also change lanes. You can use, on a four column grid, you can also have, you can use three of those columns and leave the fourth column for a caption, for example. So they're basically just a suggestion how to divide space, and you're encouraged to play with these various grid systems or various column, um, you know, column distribution to see what happens to the, to the individual space or the format that you're using. So play is, is, is a really essential thing to do in these, in these grid systems. Now, here's the horizontal grid. I'm trying to show you how you use that. It's, it's for me, one of the most important and most underestimated and unfortunately in design, kind of hard to find grid. Um, but once you do, you have you you realize it's it's in, it's invaluable because it keeps text justified over columns, right? And it also divides space for things like text in relation to pictures. And there's a lot of really, how should I say, very complicated ways to get these horizontal grids to work. But this is sort of the basic set, and I just encourage you to really look into using these horizontal grids. Uh, in connection with your vertical grid. So sketching on a horizontal vertical grid will look something like this. That's what I mean by having a, in this case, five column uh, layout that you're actually using two columns of text plus one column um, of captions, for example. And we used to sketch, you know, with pen and pencil on a grid all the time to just see how space can be divided up and how a layout particularly if you knew you had 10 photos and this amount of text, you could lay out with this gray space like that. And nowadays, obviously, you can fill it with all the pictures automatically, which is a real time saver, but actually it's, it's good sometimes to take a step back and try it with pen and paper, paper as well. What I also wanna encourage you to think about is the fact that white space need not be filled. <laughs> um, Catherine has this wonderful office and a lot of it is just completely empty. And when I walk in and put my, I don't know, my bags, whatever, on her beautiful empty space, she sort of has, I don't want to say a fit, but she'll, she'll, she'll say, well, wait a minute, this is, this is not space that is there to be filled. It's space to hold the rest of the room together, so to speak, or to, to, to have a particular effect. So again, architecture, 
her office space can transport onto a two-dimensional space. White space gives, gives the space that is full more value or more, more attention to the space that is filled. So I encourage you to use white space. It's your friend. Try it out and just leave space empty. To, it'll put a focus on the, on the space that is filled. And also give the reader time out, so to speak. So we're done with grids. The next, the next design um, rule or uh, suggestion is typefaces. Typefaces and typography must be chosen with great care. And we do a lot of little um, short sort of skits with, with students to teach them what I mean by the fact that type is character. Um, and I'm gonna give you one example right now. So what long ago, um, knowing what font is what was a specialty of designers. Nowadays, it's a design democracy, meaning I'm guessing if I would ask you all to say, please type in what the first, second, and third font is, you probably all pretty quickly get it right. That the first one is da 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 da, -da the second one is da da da, -da and the third one is da da da, -da right? So I'm gonna give you the answer. Of course, it's Times New Roman, Arial, and of course, Comic Sans. So everybody knows these. This is now a special knowledge that's general knowledge, basically worldwide. But we know that with each different font, like Comic Sans has now become sort of a comic font that, you know, I, I actually saw it used by the receptionist at a doctor's office with their, with their um, you know, posting signs for patients. And I found it really funny that they would use Comic Sans and not find it comical. So it is, it is a font that is, you know, used in circum circumstances. But you must know that type is character. And this is a second little test. Um, what I mean by that, each a, a serif font, like the first font has serifs. The, the second font I would say is more of a display font. And the third font is a sans serif. Okay, so it doesn't have serif. So, I'm, I'm guessing some of you that are car buffs might be guessing which font belongs to what, but I'll give you the answer right away, which of course the first one is Mercedes-Benz or Daimler-Benz, and the second one is Porsche, and the third one is BMW. And they've all used different fonts to express their corporate image. And it's, it's um, pretty much, I would say, state of the art that the corporations will have their own font or, or develop their own font to express this character that they want to encapsulate in a, in, a, in a font. So that's the first thing is to choose your fonts carefully for the content that, you've, that you're determined to communicate. And the next thing is to use that font with hierarchies, meaning using different weights, using different sizes, using um, different colors perhaps, but where I would say go slow on that one, but you could also use different colors. So to establish typographical hierarchies to guide the reader along. Anybody that's a New York Times reader or a Süddeutsche Zeitung or a lot of newspapers are still doing this in a very classical, um, well typeset way. So if you need an example, or a lot of magazines do too, they, they really stick to, to decent typography. So that's a good, good way to get yourself inspired on how to use hierarchies. Um, this is an, a quote, Kurt, what, Kurt Weidemann was the designer that did the fonts that you just saw for um, corporate A, S, and E for Daimler-Benz. And this was a quote from him, good typography supports the contents, not the designer. And that means not the designer of the font, but also not the designer of the piece. And I would absolutely agree with him. Um, this is going straight to the next rule. So we're done with typography in a way, but we're doing something else now with typography, which is the next rule, which is visual impact. So you were probably wondering what the heck was that? Well, it's small surprises that keeps the audience interested and new, interp er, new interpretations coming that will keep people on their toes and keep them, well, with their, let's say we had, we're, we're all sort of getting into a lesser attention span and, it, and it's given the, the, the goal of the designer to keep the, to keep the attention span alive. <laughs> let's put it that way. So, 
I'll let you think on that one on your own. But the next rule is um, with images. And that might be part of the uh, visual impact, but understand when you're using an image, a picture is worth a thousand words. That's an old saying that I had, I, I knew that before I was a designer. That was a part of my childhood, actually, um, that, that saying. But the question is why? And you can Google this 60,000 60, times faster thing and we'll find all sorts of sources. There's um, various people that were taking credit for it, but the fact of the matter is that the brain, that the brain processes images 60,000 times faster than text. And 90% of all human communications is visual. And that's because it's an instinctual thing. We need images to you know, to survive in our surroundings. Text is, is something different. There's, there's symbols that we need to learn. We don't understand them as babies. We understand our mother's face. We don't understand letters until much, much later. So that's a clue that when you use images, you need to know what you're doing. Um, so a glance, meaning 0.1 seconds is enough to make a first assessment, as you probably saw with that five of what's going on, and only, and you need only two seconds to actually remember an image to store it in your visual, you know, data bank. So, using a good one um, for starters is important, but then to use one that is getting to your point, and then choosing a focal point, meaning learning how to crop an image, is sort of essential. There, we're, we're inundated with really, really good, I think, um, photo, photographic material, both because lots more people are making it, it's, it's, it's become easy, fast, and cheap to, to make good images. So we, we can deserve to be discern, discerning and, um, you know, very discretionary about what we're doing with our images. So choose a focal point that supports your meaning. So here you can see, is it the, is about the boat? Is it about the lighthouse? Is it, is it about the mountains? What is it actually about? And crop your photos accordingly. Um, I recently, you know, first used this tool, which was very, very cool. The, and again, this is the German um, translation for the Inheitssensitive Anpassung. I don't know, I don't, maybe Clara can help me with that one. What the content, um, it, it's, the, it's the function in InDesign that, that will help you when you have um, picture boxes to, to automatically find the, 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 the central motive of the, or the central meaning in the, in the photos that you're using. As it happens, these are, these are, I just plug these in and the, and the AI, this in, 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 in content, I don't know what one person is, help me out there, Clara, um, but the, I, is it the AI will Lucas, discover? Yeah, Lucas just chimed in. Is it content aware fit? That's it. it. Content aware yeah. fit. Thank you. Thank you, Lucas. So the AI will will find the fit. So it will find the the central focus of an image. And at first, I thought, all right, I don't know. <laughs> you know, I've been doing my own cropping for a long, long, long time. Let's see. Let's take this AI for a ride. And you know, surprisingly, it was excellent. Um, it just really did a great job, and I encourage you to try that first off. And you can always adjust it afterward and see how that goes if the cropping is 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 the way you want it. It sure is a time saver, so that's that's definitely one assistant to look at to find those focal points. Another thing I'd like to um, encourage you to do, because first of all, I love um, vector graphics and illustration in general as an alternative to images, uh, ima, uh, you know, um, photographic images. images. Um, there's, there's some material out there, some topics out there, I don't know, maybe the, uh, the atom comes to mind, that isn't really extraordinarily easy to do in a photographic way. So, um, and that, I know a lot of excellent illustrators that just will find, you know, a, a great, great and very emotional way to, to express it with illustration. So you might want to explore that as well. Um, and another way to, to which I'm currently working on a, a workshop for, for this is with infographics. Um, there's often really no other way. It's, it's sort of tricky because data graphics, data is a tricky thing, but 
data graphics are amazing. Uh, it's an amazing way to make complex things understood quickly. I'm not sure if you're familiar with this particular graph, but it's, it's, a, it's a very old one that's fascinating about the march of troops to Moscow in the orange and the amount of troops that returned is this very, I don't know, it gets me at, at least in my heart every time when you see that black line is the troops that returned after a, the cold winter and the fighting. So um, yeah, just, just it's, it's a graphic way to express a real tragedy. And infographics, um, I encourage you to look at that also as an alternative to finding a, a great image, you know, good images for your, for your design. One thing that needs to be discussed though, obviously, is that image rights are important. And because it's so easy to pull images from all over the place, it, I, ha I must, I ha always have to tell this to my students again and again, it's full of perilous implications and rights are, we just have to remember that somebody's the creator of these rights and they hold the rights. So you need to educate yourself and your students about image rights to support the image makers and the artists to, you know, purchase or do it properly or make your own images whenever possible if it's not, if it's not available to you to use data banks and, and stock photos. Um, just to be aware of that and to, to, to keep your um, students aware of that as well. And, you know, as an educator, you're, you're, you're showing them by doing it, doing it the right way yourself. I think that's important to, um, to bring up. Another so we have a, rule, well, a quick calling... question, actually going back, yeah. I think two slides um, of the, I think we just said a picture of the chickens. Um, is is it called a worm's eye view? Yeah, there's there's the, the frog's eye view. Well, the worm is probably even lower down than the frog, I guess. <laughs> but it's the frog's eye view, the bird's eye view, and um, there's various other focal points that are that are more. Um, uh, I don't know the terminology right now off the top of my head, but um, there's there's all different ways of, of focal, you know, ways to find focal um, focal points that that, that that attract attention. I guess this would be the worm's eye view if you you know if you're looking at the chicken, yeah, pretty much. Yeah, you know? very <laughs> very fitting for chickens, right? <laughs> very fitting for chickens. That especially that middle one is like right gonna peck in your at your nose. Um, so yeah. <laughs> So yeah, try to explore with that. I think that's um, really important to just look at what you're trying to say and then you know try to find solutions to your imagery. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're at rule number seven or um, design basic number seven, which is to know your color. And it sounds easy. It seems like oh sure, color it's easy peasy, but it's it's really not. Um, there's all sorts of various sources of color theory, and I encourage you to look at those. Um, Wikipedia is a great source to look up color theory, by the way. Um, and the reason why is color triggers emotion. Um, the psychology of color perception is important because you are achieving an effect. If you use green, for example, you, you know, if you paint a room green, if you um, do a logo in green, you are, uh, you're, you're, you're pulling out a certain emotional trigger. If you use red, obviously we're all pretty clear on red because it's the color of blood, it's the cover, color of emergency, we're clear with that. But it's also probably one of the most used colors for soup for some reason. <laughs> and, um, you know, walk through a supermarket and see what color does. Blue, another color that is a big one. Um, is, is tranquility, but it's also the color of serious things like banks or um, insurance companies, et cetera. So uh, there's lots of fascinating charts out there too on the internet, what logo is in what color. And it is interesting to see that some, some, some types of businesses do tend to one color or the other. So that's also something to think about. Um, but in the nitty gritty of the actual doing something uh, and creating something as a designer, there's there's a basic thing to know, and that is the difference between additive and subtractive colors. And as you see here, I think RGB, we're all clear um, with our phones and televisions and computers, pretty much now that light is um, RGB. 
So that's that red, green, and blue dots. And the reason that they're additive is because when you, when you combine them, it adds light. So when you put them on top of each other, more light is created, which means that's why the name additive is um, fitting. Subtractive is the opposite. So what, when, you're, when you put print colors on top of each other, they subtract light, meaning the dots C, M, and Y, so cyan, magenta, and yellow. The K, coincidentally, I don't know, some people might know this, but it's, it's um, not K is who, who spelled black wrong. <laughs> um, it's K is for key, because in um, regular or in classical offset printing, the key was the black, the, the black um, film that had the most information on. Most, most images have more information in the black black film than any than the other three so that was where they keyed the other films to match that's why the k is in there and not a, a s or a b but that these are pigments so these are actual pigments that go on the printing machine so it's it's actually subtracting light by you know by going on top of each other um but when we talk about pigment pigments another thing to know is that the c m y and k that they're um Oh, they're not opaque, so they they kind of add on top of each other the way watercolors do. When you're designing, it's something you really want to think about because it does achieve great effect and emotion with really colors that pop. And colors that pop are usually spot colors. And these spot colors, I use the uh, analogy with um, potato printing, like with little kids, you you know have the tempera paint and you use potatoes and you put with a brush to put the tempera paint on the potato to print, right? That's how spot colors work. They're pigments that, are, that actually are mixed in pots and are they achieve much more brilliance than the CMYK, particularly in the, in the orange and the greens, uh, way more brilliance than you can achieve with the CMYK um, color scale. So you might want to think about experimenting with that as well. So, all of that together, I would say, um, it, it, it sounds it sounds quite quite um, how should I put it quaint almost to say create beauty, but it's not as easy as it sounds. All those rules sort of combine as a as the kitchen set to then go forth and create beauty. And I encourage you to look up Dennis Dutton. I, I um, show this to my students nearly every time um, his talk about beauty on his TED talk. He's since passed, but the TED Talk is still up and it's wonderful talking how, about how humans perceive beauty and that we find beauty in something done well, meaning um, we understand when something done well means, um, you know, a, a, a basketball star or a player or, um, or a maestro in a Philharmonic concert that can play piano wonderfully. But we're all designers now, and we all think we can do it just out of the, you know, off the cuff of our hand without ever learning anything, and that's kind of not really how it works. So I encourage you to be inspired by people that have gone before you and do things well, designers that inspire you, artists that inspire you, and create beauty by, um, you know, finding examples of things that you find beautiful. And this one is, I think we all can agree, um, choose your tools wisely to create beauty, which the classic tool that I still love, it might not be a pencil always, but it's, it's always paper or paper-like. <laughs> and sketching and getting ideas onto that paper before you turn to the digital um, is, is I, I can't stress enough how, how effective that is to get your thought processes going and get the ideas rolling. And then you can choose your two digital tools, which is very important to say, when do I choose Photoshop? When do I choose Illustrator? When do I choose InDesign? And they're all sort of merging into each other, but, but different tools do have different strengths. And I encourage you to look at, you know, the strengths of each one. Obviously, you're, you're not going to do a flyer in Premiere. <laughs> so we know that much. And um, so choose those tools wisely. The last design basic rule I would say is to, it's, it's sort of almost Jobsiask, and I, and I do sort of, um, I do admire a lot of the things that he thought and, and did, 
but this is sort of my take on it is to be forgiving with your with your design um foot you know your, the first steps of your design career <laughs> and because design always changes i think any any project i've ever done if i had the task to do it again it would be different so be forgiving with whatever you've done just be, remain curious remain creative love the technologies at your fingertips love what other people are doing to, that are that is inspiring to you and helping you your ideas to also come to fruition and even the ideas that you have had and have done can be revisited you know redesign is 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 an actual viable and and actually very fun thing that is a challenge not only for students so yeah good luck in making good design that's about it if you have any questions, I'm very open to questions. And I've had the 10 design rules, it's a little bit more than what I've told you, but I have it as a PDF also, I'll make that as an asset as well. Okay, well, thank you so much, uh, Maureen. I feel like I've learned so much within this session um, and there's a lot of great conversations going on um, just with the different perspectives we have um, from Sweden and from Jordan, um, you know, sharing back and forth different ideas. Um, and then Lucas has shared some examples with us too. Um, and then I'll open it up to any other Q&A. Um, and so while I'm waiting for those, Maureen, if there are other websites or resources for those who are watching the recording, um, how can they best kind of either get in touch with you or access some of these resources? Um, I'm absolutely open on the edX, as everyone knows. And um, Maureen at Belaski.de also, can, we can, I can, well, I guess I can type that in too. So I'm very communicative. <laughs> um, I'm open to emails and, you know, any other way. I'll I'll um, I'll put the stuff that I've done uh, up on the edX as assets. And if I think of more links, I have tons of link lists. So I'll try to put them in 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 the ten rule categories, different links for each rule. That might help. Yeah. Good, good idea. Perfect. No, thank you. And we'll be sure to share that out um, with the recording. Well, I'll stop the recording there. Thank you again, um, Maureen, so much for joining us. Um, be sure to join us next week um, as we will have our next uh, creativity workshop. Have a great afternoon. Awesome. You too. Thank you.